Some might consider it the end boss of Touch Designer. So today, we are gonna dive into GPU-based processing, the magic that not only enables you to suffer for eldering at smooth 60fps, but also might send you on even harder quest lines. One of those hardcore quests is to evolve Pikachu into Raichu only using the power of GLSL. Here is what we're going for. Now this morph animation is not only applicable to Pokemon sprites, it works for other inputs too. However, since I'm a 27-year-old guy with an affinity for a game marketed towards kids, I thought that morphing through the entire generation 1 Pokedex would be a fun free time activity. Alright, let's hop right into it. First, we got to set the stage. For the inputs, grab two movie file intops, one for the Pikachu and the other for Raichu. Go ahead and catch these Pokemon in the description below. Connect these movie file intops to a GLS L-top, which will handle the morph effect. To add a smooth animation progress value, we are using an LFO with a frequency of 0.1. Add a math job to that, output it to a null and call it progress. This will eventually take care of the morphing effect's pace. I like to manage key parameters in a constant job. First create two resolution variables, resw and resh. Map these to a custom resolution in all three tops. Ok, before we dive into the GLSL top, note that this video should be beginner friend. So the first few sections will cover some programming and GLSL basics. First of all, there are various shaders. But since we need to manipulate individual pixels for this effect, we will focus on the fragment shader, aka pixel shader. Now the key point to GLSL shaders is that the code runs on your GPU. Unlike your CPU, which handles tasks one by one, the fragment shader code gets executed on every single pixel on your screen. So Full HD means over 2 million pixels getting manipulated simultaneously. This concept is called Parallel Processing. Alright, let's cover the GLSL top. It comes with two important dats. One of it is the GLSL pixel dat, which is your code editor. The other is the GLSL info dat, which is your console. It will shout if your code has any errors, but for now, compiled successfully means we are all good. Okie dokie, let's take a peek at our pixel shader code. Notice the green lines in the code starting with forward slashes? These are comments. Think of them like those laminated sheets in some public restrooms. They might suggest you to sit down to pee, but they don't actually enforce it. Similar to that, comments don't affect our code's execution. They are notes to yourself or others, a way to explain tricky parts or leave reminders. Since our code won't look anything like the default example shader, let's re rewrite <laughs> that comment to say more fragment shader. Pro tip, use comments to disable potentially useful code without deleting it. Derivative even left us one of those. Let's see what happens if we uncomment it. Hmm, cool. <laughs> it actually broke the code. But don't panic, the info that might help us. It gels redefinition error on line 9. Now redefinition means that we gave the same name to two distinct things. So the word color appears a few times. Let's rename our color to Pokecolor instead. Cool. Alright, now grab Pokecolor and paste it right here. Nice, the Pikachu from the movie file in top just spawned inside the GLSL viewer. It seems that whatever we defined previously gets displayed as soon as we paste it inside here. If we change this back to color, the GLSL viewer turns white again. We will find out why this is shortly. But first, let's talk about what we defined with Pokecolor. The answer is, it's a variable. Think of variables like Pokeballs. As a trainer, you have various Pokeballs containing different Pokemon, one holds Pikachu, another holds Bulbasaur. Now these specific variables hold colors. But variables can store other things too. To tell GLSL what a variable contains, you need three things. The data type, the variable name, and the value. By the way, this sign here is a semicolon and in programming it's used to mark the end of a line of code. Okay, the data type tells GLSL what type of data to store. This variable is a vec4, meaning it holds a four-dimensional vector. We will cover vectors in a bit. The variable name tells GLSL how to refer to a variable. Now this is totally up to you. You could name it anything, but clear names help. Since this stores a color, calling it color makes totally sense. The value tells GLSL the actual data stored in the variable. This isn't always needed when defining a variable. Actually, you can assign a value later in your code. Frag color, for example, is declared, but it gets its value further down. So, the color variable stores a four-dimensional vector, which apparently represents a color. But what the heck is a four-dimensional vector, you might ask? Well, in computer graphics, colors are made up of three color values, red, green, and blue. And one for the opacity, which is alpha. That's four components, neatly stored in a VEC4. 
So does this mean that white has only one component? Well, not exactly, but with a VEC4, GLSL uses this single value for all four components. So one is the same as one, 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 one. All right, let's just play around a bit. Change green and blue to zero, leaving red and alpha at one. Unsurprisingly, the color turns red. Adding a bit of green gives us orange. Lowering the alpha channel to 0.5 makes it translucent. All right, all right, almost done with basics. But before we jump into the more functionality, we should find out what functions actually are. Now, a function is a reusable set of instructions. Similar to variables, you define them once and use them for all your code. You can spot function definitions by parentheses followed by curly braces, which hold the set of instructions. A function call, however, is identified by the name of the function and parentheses, which might also accept arguments. This is the part where you actually use a function. Think of functions like machines performing a specific task. A juicer makes juice. The type of juice, however, depends on the fruit you put in. So some functions take arguments, which then have an impact on the function's outcome. Two of these are the texture function and the TD output swizzle function. But hold on, we did not create those, but yet are able to use them? Yeah, because these are predefined GLSL or touch designer functions. Output swizzle, for example, ensures cross-platform color consistency between Windows and macOS. Texture, on the other hand, samples the color of an input, which is this, at a specific pixel, which is that. Now the main function is special. It acts like the GLSL top start button and gets triggered by touch designer automatically. Now uv.st is a touch designer variable that we use to provide the texture function with the coordinates of each pixel in the input. Let's rename it to vov.xy to make it clear. The first value is the x coordinate, the second value is the y coordinate. These coordinates range from 0, 0 on the bottom left to 1, 1 at the top right of our input. Now let's define our own function. Since we are manipulating colors, the function will return a VEC4, a color. Hence, we are picking VEC4 as the data type. I will call it morph to make clear what it does. And within the parentheses, I'll just pass VEC2 UV as an argument. Within the brackets, we will provide GLSL with the set of instruction the morph function should execute. We want to morph from Pikachu to Raichu, so let's bring in both images using the texture function. For that, copy this existing texture line and paste it inside the morph function. Duplicate the line and name one variable from color and the other to color. Change this zero in the second variable to a one to specify on the input you want to pick. Now, as mentioned before, this function will return a color. Let's define it by typing return mix parentheses from color to color one. Now set the value of the color variable to be whatever the morph function returns by calling the function. This throws actually an error. That's because the morph function expects an vec2 argument. So we'll just pass vuv.xy as an argument. This is like setting a vec2 uv variable to hold vuv.xy as its value. Hence, we are able to use uv throughout the code when referring to vuv. However, this variable is only valid within the morph function. Cool, so mix is yet another built-in GLSL function. It blends the first two values based on the third value, which represents a mixing factor. Currently, we see Raichu, because the mixing factor is set to 1. If we change it to 0, we will see Pikachu. At 0 0.5, we get a ghost-like overlay of both. Now, since we implemented a progress LFO, let's make use of it. Turn on the viewer on the progress null job. In the GLSL tops vector panel, name the first vector of progress and drag the progress LFO channel into the first value slot. Cool, progress is now usable within our code. Uncomment this line and replace example uniform with progress. There is no need to assign a value to this uniform variable since it gets its value directly from the LFO in touch designer. Let's use progress in our mix function. Wow, this looks um correct, I guess. The progress value oscillates between zero and one, so we're mixing the inputs at different intensities for each frame, creating a fading animation. Now to make the fading a little bit smoother, just multiply the from color with the negative progress and the to color with the positive progress. Alrighty, we have got some basic animation going, but we still need to capture a complex visual appeal of a morphing animation. For that we need, well, 
more complex and dynamic calculations. So let's take a look at the concept of slopes. In GLSL, slopes refer to the rate of change of varying variables like texture coordinates. Let's start simple. Declare a vec2 slope variable, set it to slope equals to vec2, parentheses 0.1 times progress, and 0.1 times progress. Okay, now we can use the slope in the from and to color variables. I'll just add and subtract from UV. Hmm, <laughs> now this is still boring as fuck, but it perfectly visualizes how changing the slope's x and y coordinates affects the pixel change rate on each axis. Tweaking the first x coordinate accelerates the animation across the x axis, so horizontally. Changing the second y coordinate does the same for the y axis, so vertically. Okay, now in order to inject some sweet dynamics, we need some values that change per frame and per pixel. Remember from color and to color? They already do this, since the texture function samples each pixel's color and the progress LFO manipulates those colors over time. But first, let's spice things up a bit. In the constant chop, create an offset value and set it to 0.05, and then export it to the GLSL Tops Vectors panel. In the GLSL code, define offset as a uniform variable. Now copy and paste the from and the two color variable lines, but rename them to tr from color and tr to color. Now instead of adding slope, add offset as a vec2 to the UV variables. Now what this does is sampling the color of a pixel slightly above and to the right of the current pixel. That's why we added tr, which means top right, to the variable names. Let's do the same for bottom right, br, top left, tl, and bottom left, bl. Cool, now we have a bunch of VEC4 values ready to play with. We'll use these to calculate our slope values. First create two VEC4 variables, sx and sy. One will hold the x component of the slope, the other the y component. Now let's go nuts and calculate the difference between, um, well, what do I know and what the heck. By the way, you may copy these specific calculations from the comment section below, which I would totally recommend for now, but I would encourage you to you know, go nuts yourself and try out different calculations at the end of this video. Okie dokie, still nothing changed. Well, that's because this was just an overly complex setup for the actual slope calculation. Grab SX and calculate slope X by adding all its channels together. Now grab SY and calculate slope Y by adding all its channels together. So this does, um, something. So let's proceed by implementing some kind of relation between the slope and the animation progress. For this, create a vec2 morph variable and set it to slope times 0.75. Create a morph from and a morph to variable, set them to morph times 1 minus progress and to morph times progress. Use this in the from color and to color texture call. Nice, we're onto something there. But there's a catch. The animation is, well, a bit wild. That's because slope X and slope Y can go beyond 1, since adding all 4 RGBA channels could technically even result in 4. Okay, remember, visible pixels in GLSL have coordinates between 0, 0 and 1, 1. Hence, our animation is all over the place. Now, we could technically divide the slope by 4, but that would be too easy. Plus, it wouldn't be very dynamic. So, let's go ahead and define a float variable called limiter. Set it to be the dot product of slope and slope. Now what the dot product does is actually multiplying slope x with slope x and slope y with slope y in this case. Now divide the slope by this just created limiter inside the morph variable. Okay, nice. Now some weird fragment spawns. To fix this, let's add some strength to the limiter. Let's try 0.75. Alrighty, my friends, at this point we are almost done. The basic function is up and running, but I'll just go ahead and polish it a bit to fit my visual expectations. Also, those static numbers in the slope calculations bother me. Let's create another uniform variable called strength. Now, using the strength slider and the constant chop, enables you to simply adjust the morph effect's strength. 
Slightly adjusting the offset will also alter the looks of the morph effect. Okie dokie, now as always with Touch Designer the possibilities are endless. I for example have added some Python codes to loop for the entire Generation 1 Pokedex. Now if you are curious about the Python side of things, check out the original project files on my Patreon. Oh, I wish you a wonderful day and see you next time. Thank you.